Protestants obviously take their origin from St. Benedict, uh, who was born in the year 480 in Norcia, in uh, northern Italy, nor north of Rome. And as a young man, was sent to Rome to study, a liberal arts study, and he saw how students lived and what was going on in Rome at the time, became very disillusioned and decided to leave Rome and leave studies and search for a different kind of wisdom. And so Benedict left and became a hermit, lived in a cave for three years. Uh, he met a monk from a known monastery nearby who supplied him with food and presumably with some idea of what the monastic life was all about. And soon people discovered him and they discovered that he had spiritual gifts. And so people came and asked his advice about the spiritual life. And in turn, they brought him the things that he needed. And before long, uh, they asked him if he would found a monastery. Uh, the first monastery uh, that he found was at, at Subiaco and then 12 other monasteries in the vicinity. And basically, uh, after some time in those monasteries, he went to Monte Cassino, south of Rome, where he established the great Monte Cassino, uh, where he is buried. Well, St. Benedict is, is famous, uh, not just because he founded monasteries, but he wrote a rule, a remarkable for its discretion, we are told, by Benedict's biographer, Gregory the Great. It's a very short rule, 73 short chapters, and it really is a compendium of monastic wisdom, uh, he, which he took from other monastic fathers before him, but he put it together in his own personal uh, synthesis. So the rule became famous, uh, and in the Middle Ages, because of Charlemagne and, and others, it became sort of the uh, approved rule uh, for the Western monks in the Western in the Roman Empire. As for the monastery itself, um, there is a motto of the order which tries to summarize what the life is about. It's a little oversimplified, but it works. Ora et labora, uh, prayer and work. Because the monk's day, the monk's life, is really divided uh, among, uh, between prayer and work and living the community life. There was a wave of German immigration to Manchester, not a huge wave, but a significant one because of the mills that were here, the Industrial Revolution, and Manchester was one of the, was the largest textile producing uh, city in the world at one point. And those German uh, people uh, needed a pastor. They needed someone who could speak German, preach to them in their own language, etc. There were only two Catholic colleges at that time in New England, uh, Holy Cross, Worcester, and Boston College in Boston, both Jesuit institutions, both too far away uh, for people to commute and far too expensive for the children of mill workers to afford that kind of education. So the bishop said, well, if I ask a French-Canadian order, the Irish won't come. And if I ask the, an Irish order, the French won't come. It was that virulent, the, the kind of split that was here. And so he said, well, let me try the Germans. So he contacted the abbot in Newark, New Jersey, and asked if he would come here to start a college. And so the abbot says, well, we, we just really can't do that. There's no way we could start a college. Uh, but the bishop was very persistent, and he tried again and again. And finally, he was a little bit sly, I would say. That's putting it nicely. He, uh, he said to the abbot, gee, it's too bad these German Catholics up here are going to Protestant churches because there's nobody who speaks German up here to say Mass for them and preach to them. Couldn't you send one German-speaking monk up here to at least start a parish for the Germans? And I think the abbot felt guilty and uh, said, okay. But a year later, um, the abbot was coming up to visit the monk, Sylvester York, who was the pastor and who had built St. Raphael's. So he took the train from uh, from Newark to come up here, and the bishop met him 
in a coach, horse-drawn coach. And instead of taking him to St. Raphael's, uh, he took him to three sites. And the abbot said, well, why are we going up here? He said, well, this is the place where you're going to found the college. And the abbot says, look, I told you, we can't found a college. He said, just look at the sites. And when they arrived at this one, the abbot fell in love with the site. It was the old Gilman farm, and he, he really warmed up to the idea. And so the, the community uh, began here uh, in 1889, became an abbey in 1927, and has been here ever since, uh, conducting a college, doing pastoral ministry, living the monastic life here in Manchester. Well, I think a, a Benedictine education is distinctive because it, is, it flows out of the distinctiveness of the Benedictine rule and the Benedictine order and the Benedictine culture that grows on a particular campus. The vow of stability that Benedictines take that other religious communities do not take is another factor which makes the Benedictine style of education a little bit more distinctive. Namely that when you make your vows here, you stay here until you die. And so that creates um, both on the campus itself, but also uh, among the alumni of the college, a, a, a link and a connection that that is different from, uh, from other places where the longevity of service uh, of people working at a college isn't guaranteed, so to speak, or is, isn't as uh, lasting. There is an aphorism in the, in the order that, in a Latin phrase, uh, that if you keep the rule, the rule will keep you. That by really giving yourself to this, it will save you. It saves you from having to make all kinds of everyday decisions of what am I going to do and what am I going to wear and what am I going to eat and what am I going to do this. Well, it's all there. And if you can give yourself to that, it takes discipline in the beginning to, to, to really get into that habit. Once you do, it's very freeing. People find that to be life-giving. And I think that's what the rule, somebody described the rule as a life-giving way.